This is The Enrage, a show where we take a deeper dive into written works published at the Center for a Stateless Society. Join us as we give voice to the ideas challenging the vain phantoms that haunt our social reality and stand in the way of total liberation. For more information, visit c4ss.org. And to support this show or any of the other projects happening at the center, please visit patreon.com slash c4ss.org. Thank you for listening. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to The Homme Roger. I'm your host, Joel Williamson. You're listening to the second half of our conversation with the Tech Learning Collective. In the first half of our discussion with TLC, we explored what the Tech Learning Collective is, and we also began dissecting an article they wrote for the center called Imagining an Optimistic Cyber Future. This installment is the second half of our conversation. Thanks again for tuning in, and thank you for your support. So at one point in the article, you describe how we're making the machines who are buying our thoughts. If this is true, it seems criminally underemphasized in popular discourse. Can you break down what that means and how we can know that it's actually happening? Yeah, there's... um... There's a number of sort of things in there. That was a line that that I think, you know, we're trying to cram a lot of ideas into a relatively short essay. And it might require a little bit of understanding about like how this economy, you know, this surveillance economy, this capitalist Silicon Valley market, right, like actually works. So in brief, right, anytime that you're interacting with a computer that isn't yours, right, you're giving someone else information about you. And the way to, the way to think about this is like if you pick up the phone, right, and call somebody, it doesn't matter if they pick up the phone or not. They know that you called, right? You are you are making a connection. You're trying to reach out, right, to somebody else. And so when you load, for example, Facebook.com, right, you are calling Facebook, right? You're picking up the headset. This time it's your browser. You're making a phone call over a dial tone called the internet, right, to Facebook. And they know that you called, right? So they know that you tried to connect to them at that moment in time. Then if you actually do connect and you can post something, right, on Facebook, you're giving them more and more information. So simply interacting, is feeding this sort of like data collection machine, which is obviously a hard thing to get out of, right? The cliche way to say this is if you're not paying for it, right, you're not the consumer, you're the product. And while that's true, again, it doesn't really reflect the full extent of what's going on because even if you were paying it, uh, paying for it, for example, you're still making, right, that same connection. You're still actually picking up the phone and calling. You're still feeding data, right, to those machines, right? And by letting them possess all of your important data, right? And again, by important data, what we mean is everything about you, right? Like your thoughts, your habits, your subconscious mannerisms, right? Like when you post, you know, what you had for lunch today, right? There's a lot of information there, um, everything. And the goal very explicitly for these businesses, right, is that they want to own you, like to literally make you into and treat you as property. I mean, intellectual property, right? Data, but still property, right? The whole movement towards intellectual property, which is its own nightmare, is showcasing that. So for example, like a really illustrative example of this in the business world is this tool called Chorus.ai. That's a subscription service that businesses pay for to help their salespeople perform better. It's, you know, report stats like the longest monologue at a given meeting, the percent of time a salesperson spoke, you know, they suggest that uh, you should aim for 40 to 60%, um, other details like that. And so ask yourself, right, like how does it actually do that? Well, in order to report these details, right, it's first got to collect this data and otherwise it would have nothing to report on. So it works by automatically recording Zoom calls. Simple, right, when you think about it. It just makes recordings of everything and then analyzes them. Another and perhaps even simpler example is Facebook Messenger, right? Like, have you ever, for example, lost a phone and had to replace it like with a new one, right? Like when you when you log into Facebook Messenger for the first time on your brand new phone, right, what happens? Well, you, you open your, your Messenger app and you see all the past messages with all of your contacts, right? And so again, ask yourself, how does it do that? And again, it simply records it all, right? If Facebook wasn't keeping all of your old messages, it wouldn't be able to show them to you when you get a new phone. And so at a pretty concrete level, right? Like these things are not magic. They are actually, in a way, they're kind of stupidly simple when you peel away this veneer of the slick user interface and the intentionally dense tech jargon. And so every time you're interacting with these systems, right, when you're literally any interaction, actually, it is helping them to build the model of you or to build the data representation of you. Sometimes people would call this sort of your data shadow. It's a, it's a, it's a term that's often used in the privacy circles. And that means that it's also, of course, obviously really hard to extricate yourself from because any interaction, right, 
helps them. The only actual way to not participate in that kind of building of those machines, right, that then you are then asked to pay for, right, to, to get your own, your own thoughts back, your own data, right, your own important things that are possessing all of the things about you, is to not participate. And that's a, that's a, tall, that's a tall order for a lot of people still today. It's important, I think, to recognize as part of that, that this sort of like veneer, right, of the slick user interface, that the, the intentional convenience with which they're they're trying to make everything sort of magicked away from you, right? Like, don't worry about how any of this is happening. Don't worry. Just open up your phone. You'll get all your Facebook message history. It'll be fine, right? Even though the bottom rung of that ladder, it, it really is just they're recording it and they're keeping it. That's it. That's all they have to do. It's not complex. It's not technologically sophisticated. It's not some magic innovation that they've come up with in the last five years. I mean, you know, I could have also recorded everything that you've said on post-it notes and then handed them back to you. And I would still have a record of everything you said. You know what I mean? Like it's not different just because it's the internet. It's just a record. And by using those flashy terms, by using those like interfaces, by coming up with dense tech jargon that doesn't make sense to anybody except you in the tech industry, I think what's what's important to recognize is that those are also intentional choices that are designed, right, to weed out the people who aren't already brainwashed by this, this capitalist cult of Silicon Valley, so that those who are working in that industry can continue to hoard that kind of power that those capabilities bestow as though they're like some sort of priests of this early religion, right? Like, and our goal at Tech Learning Collective is to basically peel back the layers of that onion or you know, pull back the curtain to reveal Oz or like, you know, steal their holy books and share them with anyone who wants to learn how to translate the texts, right? Like that's, that's the goal. This isn't actually a complex machine being created. It is simply, you know, an avatar of you that they don't want you to recognize as such. That's spooky. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. Yeah, it is. I mean, the spookiest thing for me about that, right, is that like, it's actually not complex, but it's, but it's hidden intentionally so and because it's hidden, it makes people, it's, it's one of those things where like, it's more scary because you don't understand it. But then also at the same time, the more you do understand it, the more evil it becomes. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's honestly, it's something that um, it's anxiety producing when you focus on it too much. And yeah, like how we're all perpetuating it by participating in these systems. You know, there's something to be said about how that happens, how that takes place and what humans value, I think. Because if you make something convenient and people find it useful, people, you know, it doesn't matter their background or their political ideology, they're likely going to adapt it. So, I mean, I wonder if that's true and we take that seriously, that means that we can not sort of technocratically manage people toward freedom, but we can at least present them with an option that meets those needs of convenience and usefulness, for example, to move toward a, a freer world. Oh, totally. And, and I think the thing that I want to I interject there, right, is that, like, remember that everything is convenient relative to something else, right? So convenience is not this absolute. What is convenient about, for example, Google Docs, right, or whatever, you know, system you're using um, is simply that you don't have to think about it. And that's not an inherent quality of Google Docs, right? That's what infrastructure is, right? You don't think about, for example, the water treatment plant every time you turn on the faucet in your in your kitchen, but it's there, right? right? And you don't think about it, not because the water treatment plant is somehow extra convenient as a service that you pay for explicitly. Anyway, um, you know, one can argue that perhaps taxes is that, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, but, the, <laughs> but the point is, right, is that it's infrastructure and it's there and you don't have to think about it. And that's what the point of infrastructure is. So Google Docs, right, wants to become infrastructure mm-hmm. so that you don't think about it. And our argument is that the problem with Google Docs being infrastructure, right, is that it's not actually the most convenient thing ever. It's just the most convenient thing if you don't have Google Docs right? If you don't have a certain kind of infrastructure, then you can't do the thing, right, that the infrastructure is providing to you. So the example of this is, again, the Netflix example from earlier, right? Like, what happens to your Google Docs, right, when your internet service goes down? Well, again, you have trouble accessing it, right? You can no longer sync your changes to it, and so on and so forth. So it's not actually the best that it could be. The service isn't actually as convenient as we want it to be, but we think of it as convenient because the History that we remember is a history without Google Docs being present. No, that's a good point. And exactly, and so so it, it's not that people are acting irrationally or that we feel like there needs to be some sort of like shame and you know shame and name you know motion. Like it's okay to use things right like that today because the alternative 
maybe is not using them. But as we move forward with increasingly usable and capable free software that is decentralized as opposed to centralized and all these other sort of movements, you know, towards the qualities of the infrastructure that we want, that we described not only in the article, but also earlier, right, in this conversation, then you can begin to see the failures and the limitations of all the things that people seem to believe are the best that it could possibly be today, right? Like Google Docs. For us, as people who, for example, have our own internal infrastructure that we self-host for managing TLC, one of the beautiful things about that is that, A, we don't pay anything beyond hardware costs for it, which is not much because, again, uh, hardware costs and you know are plummeting. We don't give up any of this sort of data in sort of a privacy concern concerning context, right? Because again, it's not someone else's computers, it's our computers. But also it means that we can continue to work when, for example, Google has an outage, right? Like, and that doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it doesn't matter to us because we're not using their infrastructure anyway. And so that is a more convenient scenario for us. Now, again, we have some technical expertise to be able to set this kind of stuff up, but that's why we started the school because we want more people to get more of those abilities, right? So that it's more feasible for more people you know, to be in control of their computing devices and be able to understand at least that they have other options for infrastructure that they can make themselves or that they can come to some local affiliation to do that for them. We talk a little bit in the article also a bit later on, maybe you'll ask about this, about like, for example, internet access just generally. And there's like a lot of community technology projects that enable internet access without having to go through a commercial provider. And what that means is you just don't have to pay a commercial provider for internet access. You might not even have to pay the community provider for internet access, right? And again, that doesn't mean you have to be an internet network engineering expert. It means that you have to be aware of or know people or have an affiliation with, right? Or have a voluntary exchange, right? With someone who does know that in the same way that like, it's really useful to have, for example, a doctor in the family, right? Or a lawyer in the family. It's really useful, right? To have a network engineer in quote, the family, even if the family is just, you know, a neighborhood group as opposed to like a blood relation. And rather than centralizing the knowledge of how to do these things in bluntly a handful of a couple hundred thousand, mostly white men in Silicon Valley, like that seems like a recipe for disaster in the same way as, for example, totally forgetting how to plant tomatoes seems like a recipe for disaster, right? Like we should know how to do that. And it's not like we shouldn't have to ask one person, right? Who's like the tomato expert to give us all of our fruit and vegetables. That is putting way too much power in that person's hands. And so it's really not a matter of technology in our perspective. It's a matter of just education in the same way that we want a society, right? Where most of the buildings have electricity, right? What that means is we have to have enough people power so that there are enough physical electricians to physically wire all the buildings in the society, right? We can't rely on one or two people to do that. Now, this is a an analogy in the physical world, so it makes sense why most people, why we need to have like a million, two million, you know, residential electricians. But the internet has a different level of scale. So I, as an individual and as a capable system administrator, right, could manage the email services or the chat services or the, you know, equivalent of a Google Docs, like a next, like a next cloud instance, right, for probably anywhere between 500 to maybe 10,000 individuals, you know, no sweat off my back, right, for a neighborhood. If I was an electrician, I couldn't wire 10,000 people's houses because that's a physical world task. But with digital technologies, right, what you gain is this level of scale that's, that's orders of magnitude beyond what you can imagine in the physical world. And so my point is that it makes sense that right now there's only a few, you know, the knowledge of how to do that is concentrated in, in a small handful of human individuals. And if we want a free society in all the ways that we mean that, then it has to be true that other people than just those, you know, handful have to learn about how the infrastructure works. There is no shortcut beyond that. We have to actually disperse that knowledge because otherwise in the sort of knowledge is power way of thinking about it, right? Otherwise we just give it all up to whoever chooses to learn it first. Mm -hmm. What are some actionable things that we should be doing right now in order to reverse this trend beyond what you just explained? I'll point to another article that we actually published on C4SS called We Have Only Four Years to Prevent a Fascist USA. Here's what we need to do now. We published that shortly after the 2020 general election. 
And, you know, we're not trying to sort of highlight electoral politics. We actually don't really give a shit about electoral politics too much. But in it, we outline these sort of four broad steps, right, that we can take immediately to set us ourselves up for a better scenario where we are more resilient against reactionary forces and fascist politics in the future. And generally, those four things follow this paradigm that we've already outlined above, so I won't go into too much detail, right? But it starts by this sort of, like, by necessity, right, with this with this individual action of learning to make use of the resources that we actually already have that are newly available to us, right? To create things like our own in-house movie libraries, which can obviate things like Netflix, right, or other service providers, right, this so-called self-hosting movement is sort of the beginning of that. And we're seeing a lot of that now more than more than we were in sort of the mid-2000s. It was there, but it was, again, it, that practice is simply becoming more widespread because it's getting both easier and, of course, it's becoming more just sort of recognized as a possibility. TLC's role in this is to make it even more of a possibility for more people and to show you that you can actually, in fact, do this without spending 20 years toiling in the industry. Like, there is another way. But once that is sort of done at an individual level, right, what you find is that because of the scale that I just described of computing, if you start up your own server, even on like a tiny $35 Raspberry Pi, you will probably have more compute power than you know what to do with. There is so much density in the capabilities of these things today that one person would be challenged to make use of it all, right? And so what that means is that you have an inherent opportunity then to find and gather others who are either doing the same thing or want to do the same thing or are sort of aligned in the ways that we talked about earlier in terms of social material impact in their lives. Maybe you can find them by coming to Tech Learning Collective Workshops. Who knows, right? But the idea is that you then have a pathway towards this collective action that can do more collectively the things that you're already doing individually, like creating physical scale neighborhood internet works, which then feeds into the localism that I talked about earlier, right? But in general, there is no shortcut, as I mentioned, to building an infrastructure that we own ourselves. Interaction and cooperation, like interaction with the current paradigm is cooperation with the current paradigm. And so anything that you can do to reduce that, again, I'm not saying everyone should go cold turkey. I'm not saying it's even possible or rational in the current scenario, but making the move away from that very quickly yields dividends in not just notions of of freedom, but also in terms of actual capabilities that you actually have, right, in your day-to-day work. And we just have to, like, that, that's the way forward. We have to do that. Thankfully, a lot of that work is already done. As I mentioned, like the Netflix example, again, like Jellyfin is a sort of free software media server. It's beautiful. It looks like Netflix. It automatically gets metadata. It's easy to manage, right? Like it's, if you set that up for your household, I mean, it's never been easier to do that. And so a lot of this work has already been done. It's just a matter of us actually making use of it and learning, you know, to do so, which is again, what TLC hopes to make more possible for more people. When discussing the transition away from our present conditions, you wrote, quote, the autonomous pockets will quickly seek to interconnect, covering more ground as their practices and networks mature. It reminds me of Konkin's agorist vision of revolution and how concentrated centers of counter-economic neighborhoods would act as an essential part of, of a transition away from corporate and state power. Was Konkin an influence on your thought here? Um, if not, who are you taking inspiration from or what are you taking inspiration from? So there's definitely overlap, right, in this notion of sort of like community technology that we talk about with what I guess is Konkin's vertical, um, what did he call it? Vertical? Vertical agorism, maybe. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> vertical agorism. Um, and it's it's sort of, certainly related to that. But, but this sort of harkens back also to our initial impetus of like, caring more about the impact of the tactic and strategy than the source of the idea, right? And so there are certainly people in our collective who were inspired, I guess I should say, by this idea of local first organizing, right? And also that the black market or gray market economic activity is one in which is now more possible online than it perhaps was, and that that's a good thing. The other sort of like influence here, insofar as it's an influence again, right, is is actually the notions of, for instance, local libertarian municipalism or communalism, a la Murray Bookchin, later became, of course, uh, Abdullah Akalan's notion of democratic confederalism. Both Konkins and Bookchins and Akalans, they, they all have this idea of sort of starting from underneath the state system 
building an infrastructure as not exactly an alternative, but like as sort of almost like a, for lack of a way to say it, maybe a parasite right within the current system and then, and then creating a point at which you can then disconnect and stop participating. Right. And so that, that pattern generally is, is very much an, an inspiration, except that it's not either or, and it's not that we're trying to say that one of these methods is superior than the other. It's again, like that tracing paper analogy, what we're trying to do is sort of, and both these different ideas. So yes, horizontal and vertical algorithm, a la Konkin's sort of black market uh, approach is absolutely part of it, right? I mean, the more that you have an infrastructure of your own, the less interaction you have to have with an infrastructure that you have to, by virtue of interaction with, undermine your own ideals. And at the same time, right, there's a stepping stone that we should recognize as important to go from where we are now to perhaps a more idealistic or utopic vision of, for lack of a better way to say it, like full-on anarchism, where we have organizations that are locally scoped, but that are more democratic, by which I mean more lowercase d, right, people-powered in nature, a la the Akalan idea of democratic confederalism. And again, it's not that we're trying to prescribe one way or another. It's that we don't know what's going to necessarily work in the case of a given student, right? Like they might find themselves in some scenario where one tactic might be better suited for what they're trying to do than another. And our goal is to try to empower them to both understand the strategy, but also then enact the strategy through the literal empowerment, which is to say to enable them to have power in places that they did not before, that necessarily starts on an individual basis and then grows to become something that they can then include others in, right, as their skills increase. And whether they choose one vision over another in terms of these anarchist range of thought is kind of up to them. And you know, if they're not already familiar with Konkin's agorist visions of how this would happen, or if they're not already familiar with you know, with Bookchin's or Akalan's more modern ideas, obviously, you know, one of the things that's nice about, about Bookchin and Akalan is that they were almost turncoats, right, to a prior ideology. That's generally a place where, I mean, like, you know, Bookchin was famously a Stalinist. So, like, generally, we tend to encourage people to take into more consideration thoughts that have come from not only just sort of like a void, but have come from a rejection of a prior deeply held belief, because that shows a growth and an analysis that is not only useful to understand where they're coming from, like where, where our thinker is coming from, but also because it's the practice we want our students to go through, right? Most people don't come to Tech Learning Collective being like, I'm an anarchist and I want to do this, right? Like most people come to it being like, I heard something cool about this free software project, or I heard something, you know, neat about the way that you all teach and I kind of need a job, but I don't really want to care about my job, but I really need a job and like, what do I do, right? And so like, we are teaching, we are as, which I mean, we are as much a political school, right? As we are a technology school. And so, What that means is that our students are, by definition, if we succeed, they are going to be turncoats against capitalism. They currently believe in some portion of it more often than not. And our goal in showing them how much of a lie so much of technology is, the technology industry, right, is to politically engender a desire to overthrow the received wisdom that they've got. And the story of someone like Book or Akalan, right, who have famously rejected prior portions of their beliefs, right, is very much relevant there. And so both the tactic is very much a part of the like inspiration. Yes. We think it's also more possible now than it was before because coordination costs and the barriers to the kind of confederalism, right, that they're talking about is lower today than it was in, say, the 70s. <laughs> but also, right, the history is important because it's a similar pattern that any competent and successful effort is going to go through. Like you have to fail a lot to succeed. So rather than be afraid of failure, learn to fail in ways that don't hurt others (laughs) as you do it. In your section on the rise and fall of techno feudalism, you do a great job at fulfilling the goal of imagining an optimistic cyber future. However, it seems completely reasonable to look at our current situation and feel that there's really no way out. Why are the fatalists wrong? <laughs> um, we don't know. I mean, are the fatalists wrong? 
like you know i hope they are of course and i guess if we don't know it doesn't really we don't know if they are or not they maybe they you know maybe they're wrong maybe they're right i think the bigger question right is like if we accept fatalism now right then what's the point in any of this right like that it's like fatalism is inherently a preemptive resignation and that precludes any sort of future genuine attempt to succeed and beyond being fatalistic right that's kind of boring like why do anything then and i think the key takeaway there right, is that like even if they're right right even if we're doomed we're actually having a pretty good time right learning new things and helping others learn new things and collaborating with alumni groups that have been through tlc and building local infrastructures and doing all these projects right and and a, and a whole lot more so like we kind of don't care, <laughs> you know, if they're right or not. Like, we might as well enjoy what time we do have right now, right? Instead of like wallowing in some sort of pit of despair and, and, and doom and gloom. Um, but that being said, like, there is actually a lot to be hopeful about right now. You know, I mentioned all these new opportunities, not just in terms of pure technicality, but there is a wave of new interest, both politically and just in terms of shifting recognition about what's possible. And I don't think that we're actually doomed like many of the fatalists would assume that we are and again like if we are okay but i'm still gonna do this because this is like definitely more fun than sitting around and watching netflix <laughs> yeah so so relatedly at another point in the same section you describe a bleak picture of the future where quote silicon valley replaces everything with robots and right. politicians turn to even more draconian measures to quell rebellions against the technocracy of which their governments depend. Does it have to get worse before it gets better? Yeah, um, look, I, we genuinely do think that it will get worse in some places before it gets better. But we also think that it's going to get better in some places, right? And that this is going to happen simultaneously. Like, like it might stall, right? Like, like progress as we imagine it, right, is not this sort of like linear you know, progression from the then to the now and then to the future. Right? That, like, it's not how any of this ever works, right? It will improve in some areas. It'll get worse in some places. The point is that we shouldn't expect it to be a straight line, right? If we expect it to be this sort of simple, you know, step by step by step progression, then bluntly, we will have no preparation <laughs> for right, dealing with any kind of regressions. We won't be able to be prepared well for reactionary political forces. We won't be able to deal with unexpected you know, material crises like natural disasters, right? Like we should be planning for the reality we're actually in, not the scenario that we think that we're in, right? And so, yes, like in some places, it will it will probably have to get worse before it gets better. There is other places where it's going to get better and then get worse and then get better again and then sort of zigzag. Like you know, like it's 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 not a straight line. But the takeaway, in, regardless of you know whether things are getting better for you or in your locale or in you know some region, is that even if things are not going well, right? Like there is opportunity there. If things are going really well, there is opportunity there. The tactics might be different, and they should maybe be different. But there's always opportunity in any situation. And so the goal should be making the best of whatever situation you find yourself in. And again, that's part of why Tech Learning Collective tries very hard to not direct a student's project or the outcome or the ideology that they that they come with, but rather to enable them to take as much advantage of whatever situation they find themselves in, because that's going to be much more important and much more useful for them as a student, both for technical reasons, but also just for like, you know, political and emotional reasons. For sure. So some futurists are hopeful at the prospect of uploading their minds to the internet and fully merging themselves with the digital world. There's a quick mention in the article of resisting the temptation to abandon the physical realm. Why is this a temptation that we should resist? Right. I hope this is not going to sound, again, condescending, but like bluntly, that, that sort of that specific strain, right, like of the sort of future utopianism is just bluntly not something that we take seriously at all. The idea of wholly merging with the digital world is, it's unappealing, but it's also just kind of absurd, right? Like for one thing, again, we talked about this uh, earlier, like the digital world is itself grounded in the physical world, right? Like every one or a zero in a computer system is ultimately a physical thing, whether that be an electrical charge in a capacitor or a magnetic charge on a hard disk platter, right? Or like a divot in a vinyl record even, right? Like you cannot have a digital world without physical devices. It, it is impossible. So you can't ever divorce yourself, right, from physical reality, no matter how much you want to. And also, right, for another thing, like the physical analog world, we think is actually quite beautiful. And the vastness of experience that you can have there is 
wonderful and awe-inspiring and could be all kinds of pleasurable in ways that the digital world can't or is unlikely to be, or even if it was, so what? It's different than the analog world, right? So like, why abandon all the physicality in the first place, even if you could, right? The physical world is, is actually where we live. And any sort of like fantasies of disembodied avatars in some sort of virtual reality are like, okay, fun sometimes, sure, but they're like fantasies. They're not anything else. They are fantasies. And so partly like we have to resist this temptation to hyper-focus on this kind of fantasy precisely because it tears us away from the corporeal existence of an embodied human experience of the world, right? And that embodied humanness is what underlies all things, not just digital things. So for example, on the internet, we use the language of a website, right? Like the language of place. We say a website as though it's a physical location, right? A site. Even though it doesn't necessarily feel like a real place, right? Because we can travel to any other site instantly, which is to say that the address bar in your browser, right, like makes all websites feel equally far or equally near. But again, in reality, they are not, right? In reality, one website is physically farther from you than another because both websites are in fact hosted on a physical device somewhere in the physical world. And if we, we have to remember that because again, if we don't, right, then Facebook and Amazon and Google will be the ones who remember that for us. And they'll be the only ones then that know the truth. And, um, you know, meanwhile, everyone else would be, well, you know, living in a dream world, Neo. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we already are in a digital world. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, then, then, then we're doomed and we may as well just have fun with it, right? But that's the key is that, you know, even in that fictional world, right? Like that was an entire story about how physicality underlies perception. And so it's certainly an interesting train of thought. I mean, like, yeah, I know, for example, transhumanists often have a lot to say about, you know, human experience. And that's, that's fine and interesting and wonderfully contributory, right, to, to a dialogue about what it means to be a person. But if you go so far as to completely divorce yourself from a desire to be in a body in the physical world, then you are not really taking seriously, right, the material conditions in which you live. And all politics that we care about, right, are about the material conditions in which we live. Is it realistic to think that we can make the internet free? You said it was already free in some ways, but um, right. can we make it to where people can access it without having to pay for it? Yeah. And so this is another one of those things where I think like there's been this massive con perpetrated on the public, right? Like, the internet, right, is the term that we named a specific network of interconnected computers, right, of, of machines that, that, are, that are connected to each other. It is, in one of our workshops, actually, at TLC, back before the pandemic times, when we met in person, one of the classes involved building our own internet. And we did this literally inside of a single room. It was completely disconnected from, quote, the internet, but it was, in fact, an internet. It had DNS servers, so you could like, go to websites that had domain names. It had BGP routing, which connected one network on one side of the room to the other network on the other side of the room. It had physical cables. It had Wi-Fi, right? It was a real internet. It was a network of networks that were interconnected, i.e. an internet. But it had no route to the internet, capital T, capital I. And the reason why we do that class is not only to learn about how the internet works, but also to recognize right, that what the internet actually is, is just a method for communication. That's it. And so in that sense, it's already free, right? Like you don't have to pay anyone to create an internet. All the software, all the protocols, all the standards is out there and available for your use. You just have to know how to use it, which is, again, what TLC teaches. So the internet is free. The reason that people think that the internet is not free in that sense, right, is because the way that they can connect to anybody else, typically, is that they have a this device called a modem or a router, right, probably in their closet or by their TV or something, right, and they pay an internet service provider, an ISP, right, for the privilege of transiting through that device. So the way to think about this is that your ISP basically erected a toll booth, except the toll booth isn't on some highway. Right? It's literally right outside your front door, right? Your home's digital door, right? The thing that you have to exit to get to anyone else is itself or has become, because of the ISP, a toll booth. And you have to pay every time you leave that specific doorway. So if you find a route around the ISP that's charging you right to get there, then 
sure, you don't need to pay to connect with other people, right? So for example, I mentioned this a little earlier that in New York City, um, there's a, a network called NYC Mesh, and that is a community-owned, basically wireless ISP, except that you don't have to pay to connect to it because it's a community-owned network, right? And it's a, I think at this point, it's also now a 501c3. But the point is that there, there, there are networks like this all over the world. In Cuba, as recently as a couple of years ago, right, there was a community-created network called SNet, or known as the Street Network. And again, it was disconnected from the internet, but had all the things you would expect on quote, the internet, like game sites and social networking and news and so on and so forth. But because of the U.S. embargo, it was disconnected, right? It was not allowed to connect to, quote, the internet. And so it was its own little sort of, its own pocket of internetworked uh, computers. And that didn't cost money to connect to the internet. It couldn't because it wasn't connected to the internet, right? And so the point is that the technology enables us to communicate regardless of how we are billed for our communication. And the thing to recognize that there is that, right, the reason why you have, for example, an ISP account, right, and a bank account associated with it, and that they are tracking how much, for example, being with you use, right, is because one has to measure what one wants to control. So because they are invested in controlling what it is that we do and say, right, they are incentivized to measure what we do and say, because that's the only way to actually control it. But that's a choice that's completely orthogonal, has no relationship whatsoever to the actual capability of connecting to another device. That is an overlay on top of a much more foundational infrastructure. And so if you can separate those two pieces apart, then you have a much better understanding of like what's required to have the communication you want, and also what's not required to have the communication that you want. So in that sense, again, the internet's already free, right? Like back in the day, again, in the 70s and 80s, right, before the web was invented, but in the 70s and 80s, the internet existed, it was smaller, but anyone could connect basically for free as though it were a public beachfront at an ocean. You could just hop in, right, on a public beach to the ocean, because no, no one charges you to get to the waves, at least on a public beachfront, right? You don't need a credit card number to connect to the internet in the 70s because the internet was not something that was being charged for. It was just there. You had to be at a university campus, right, because it was the mainframe days. But again, connectivity just meant plugging in. Well, that's still possible today. It's just that the capitalist infrastructure around that treats it in a different way and therefore measures what you do in order to bill you all right, so you conclude the article by highlighting the potential of a liberated telecommunication network to facilitate the rejoining of social function and material function. Can you unpack what that means and maybe also explain why this is an important goal? Yeah, so this is the attempt that we made to try to connect back to that beginning of that article where we talked about the social media conversation, right? Like, a social media in its maybe deepest or fullest form, right, is again, a medium of social connectivity, a social connection. And that's what society is made of, right? Like society, the word even, right? Like it's it has the same root as social. So we have to, as human beings, right, have some kind of medium over which we can connect pre-internet, right? That was only and exclusively the physical world because there wasn't a digital world. But now we have more mediums to connect. We can go out and meet each other physically, or at least we could before the pandemic. And we can also do that right in various ways, in various spaces in so-called digital space. So the benefit of doing it in digital space right, is that we are not bounded by the rules of geography. We're not bounded by the rules of physical you know, embodiment. We can do so over long distances. We can do so over long distances very quickly. That's a new ability. That should be explored. And in order to explore that in a free way, we need to have a network that allows us to do that freely, which means it cannot be done in places like Facebook. It cannot be done by requiring payment for internet access like uh, an ISP does, right? Because that is fundamentally a non-free or constrained by others, right, social medium. And so when we talk about the possibility of rejoining sort of social and material functions in that way, what we mean is that there are opportunities to enhance and improve that social binding between people, right? That sort of like that notion of neighborhood camaraderie in ways that we haven't really had before that telecommunication can facilitate. If we are able to do that, then the 
most fundamental part of what society is, which is the choices that we make around how we are organizing ourselves for various different kinds of purposes, whether it be economic exchange or emotional attachments and so on, right? That fundamentally changes our ability to do that in ways that don't abide by the same rules as we had to in the past, like, for example, physical, physical presence. And so, the, and so the, the, the appropriate combination, right, the appropriate choices of what, what should be bound to physicality and what should not, or what could be bound to physicality, but what doesn't have to be, right? That's a thing that I think is probably the most important work of our generation, and we can't do it without telecommunication. All right. So we have, let's see. We have two listener questions. One came in just as we started recording. Cool. So the first one is, what are your thoughts on a voluntary credential system that could be used to mitigate the spread of communicable diseases? Hmm. Voluntary credential system. I might need some help understanding what what is asked there. Well, another follow-up question to that that the same person wrote was, what might a stateless vaccine passport system look like? I see. Um, wow, that's a that's a very timely question. <laughs> so, I mean, like one way to think about this, I think, right? And I'm I'm kind of spitballing here, so please don't, you know, like take this too seriously. But like one way to think about this is in this sort of the same way where we think about how 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 you might trust someone that you don't know personally, right? To do a given task. Like, you know, to solve that problem, the state uses licenses. To use the electrician example from earlier, right? Like a licensed electrician is different in some way than an unlicensed electrician. And the presumption, right, is that the licensed electrician is going to be better or more capable or more competent because they have been licensed to do the thing that electricians are supposed to do. That's not actually true, right? It's a sort of transitive assumption being made based on how much one trusts the issuing authority, in this case, the state, right, to do a good job of vetting that particular individual and their capabilities. And even so, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that because uh, they are licensed, they will do a good job for you, right? There's other (laughs) problems uh, that might arise, right? Maybe they have a bias against you, the customer, right? Or whatever. So like, those are sort of flawed in, you know, at at their core, but they, but they are in many ways, you know, the most widespread solution for trusting someone you don't already have trust in. And the reason I bring up this analogy of low licensing is because that's kind of what a vaccine passport is, right? Like, if I don't know you personally and have no social connection to you, I have no other way of knowing anything about you, then I'm not necessarily going to feel safe, right, being in a crowded theater with you, right, unless maybe you have the so-called vaccine passport. And so then the question becomes, okay, what is the issuing authority for such a passport, right? That is, it's the same problem, sort of, or I guess it's the same problem space as the licensing question. And Partly, the reason that that's such a problem (laughs) is because we have no other mechanism of sort of social point of reference, right? Like, we are interacting very often. Like, I mean, you and I, right, have never talked before. And so I don't really know you from Adam, right, Joel? Except what I know about you is mostly through your association with C4SS. And so I have some pre-existing relationship with C4SS, and so I can make some assumptions about you based on our mutual third-party friend here, right, known as the C4SS. And also, if you look at the like licensing examples, you are probably more likely to ask a friend who is an electrician to come to your house and fix a fuse or whatever it is that, that, that's going wrong with your like wiring, right? Then you are to you know pick some random person off of some electrician's directory, right? Because you know them. I mean, this is this is literally Konkin's uh, horizontal agorism, right? Like that's exactly what that is. And I think there's a lot of there's a lot of sense there. When you take that to like the vaccine passport analogy, right? The thing that I think is maybe the underlying problem there, right, is that like where are you going, <laughs> right? Like if I'm constantly traveling physically to places that I have no no social relation to, why is that? Well, that's because right that there is no alternative economy. There is no alternative reason to, you know, I'm going to a restaurant that I don't know the owners of because I don't know the owners of any restaurants, right? As an example. And if I did like know the owners of a restaurant, right? Then a stateless vaccine passport is simply my trust in them, (laughs) right? As opposed to my trust in the state. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
All right, so we actually have one more listener question, and then we'll go to the actual end of our conversation. Okay. Does TLC see a future where three bars covers every nook and cranny, or is your talk of bar-free zones where we can escape or get away and feel unplugged and disconnected because there's no signal, a signal-free wilderness space? Does that make sense? I think so. I mean, the three bars you're talking about, like uh, like cell phone signal, right? Like, I, I would think like so. Connectivity. Yeah, I mean, so like you know, the, the irony of this, right, is that like you know we can get no connectivity whenever we want. We literally just have to turn off our phones. You know what I mean? Like, just because there's <laughs> there's there's connectivity around us doesn't mean we have to actually connect to it. That is actually an individual choice that we have. And so, while you know there is value in wilderness. And I think, you know, from an ecological standpoint, you know, the earth absolutely needs to be rewilded to a certain degree. Um, you know, the, the amount of wilderness that we have lost is a death sentence for the planet. And we have to do something about that in a meaningful way. And that might very well mean, right? Like do not build here, right? Like, like you know, d- don't put a fucking cell tower in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Like maybe don't do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so that might be an example of like, you know, an, an, a signal less space. And there's some value for that, I think, both ecologically, but also, you know, spiritually. I don't actually think that that means also, right, like that we are sort of doomed to either connectivity or lack of connectivity. Like, you know, I definitely turn off the data connection and the Wi-Fi connection on my phone sometimes and just do local stuff on my phone even as well. And then also sometimes I just put down my phone. But I think maybe what's underlying that question, right, is like, how do we get back to a healthier relationship with these devices? And again, I think this comes back to recognizing what they are for us, recognizing them as a capability that we can have, right? In the same way that, for example, human bodies have different capabilities like i have a different you know level of 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 clarity of eyesight than than somebody else and i have a different sense of smell than somebody else right like these are these are things that that we can do and when i want to use that capability i have it but because i have a understanding at a deep technical level about what my phone really is it doesn't feel to me like it's calling me or like i'm sort of like you know stuck in this sort of doom scrolling uh loop because I'm the one controlling my interaction with this device. It's really, that really makes it an extension of me much more than it is me grafted right onto some, rather than me being an extension of Twitter, for example. You know what I mean? And flipping that paradigm, I think is important. Flipping that relationship in one's mind, but also just in practice, right? That, that comes from an ability to be dexterous, an ability to have a kind of sensitivity to what it is that these devices are doing for us. That bluntly not a lot of people have right now, and again, is part of what Tech Learning Collective is trying to do. It makes sense that a lot of people feel at the behest of the social networks because that's what they're designed to do to you, right? But if you understand a lot more about what's going on, then it's a lot easier to take control over right your experience with those devices. It's a lot of like you know, well-being advice, like oh, turn off you know notifications after eight p.m. and stuff, and that's that's fine and, and well, right? But that's really, really that's a shallow and superficial like suggestion. Do you know what I mean? And TLC tries to take that to the next level by giving you the kinds of knowledge and, and practical experiences that you that you need to have in order to have the relationship with technology that you want. In the same way, for example, as like, you know, it behooves you to learn a little bit about cooking, right? So that you can make the meals that you want. And then you're not beholden to someone else to cook for you or to go out to a restaurant all the time to get the meal that you want, right? You can do that yourself. And that will not only change your relationship with your meals, right? But it will change your relationship with your body because it's what you're putting in your body. Like that is the food that you're having. And so that same mindset of like you should know a little bit about this stuff, right? Because it is your your mind, it is your brain, basically. It is the non-tangible parts of your thoughts that is what the computing device is for. It is about, like, the, the, the laptop, the phones that we have, what they actually are, are our thoughts made objective, which is to say they are objects, material objects, right, in which we have inscribed our thoughts, in this case in silicon electricity, as opposed to maybe, you know, graphite and pencil, but it is that thing. And so just as you might journal on a, on an, in a diary, right, and you need to be able to read and write to be able to do this well, you need to have some sort of level of dexterity around the devices that you have in order to be able to think with them healthily. And, and potentially also the, the repulsion of three bars in a certain area, right, that then becomes a lot less scary or, or damaging to you, right? Because 
you get control over it and you feel that control over it. And it's not anymore something that's just happening around you in your environment, but you actually get to be the one to say, yeah, I want to connect right now or no, I don't want to connect right now. Are there any related groups or interesting projects that you think folks should get involved with if they want to help move towards an optimistic cyber future? Detroit Community Technology Project out in by Detroit is sort of like the NYC mesh equivalent, right? They offer free Wi-Fi, free internet access through their local community network. They always need volunteers of various kinds. There's a similar project out in Santa Fe, New Mexico. There's one in Portland, Oregon. There's obviously NYC Mesh here in New York City. There's all sorts of different projects that you can get involved with, uh, involved with. And these are just the networking related ones. So I would, you know, look into those. But, you know, much like Akalan describes the sort of like, um, you know, urgency for the Kurdistan people to to make, you know, local and democratic and federalist institutions for their for their region in order to subsume ultimately, right, the Turkish state. Like that, that is what we need to do at, at, a, at a globalist level. Like, you know, that is the kind of self-organization that needs to happen if we are to free ourselves from capitalism anyway. And that starts by necessity with individual action, but grows or could grow, right, um, into collective actions and affinity groups and neighborhood networks and that kind of thing. Where should folks go to learn more about TLC? Yeah, the best place is techlearningcollective.com, just the website. You'll find uh, calendars of events there. Um, We have probably two or three workshops every week that happen online that you're welcome to join. Those are public events. There's also um, a set of courses that are offered with much less regularity. So if you're super excited about this, I, I highly recommend the workshops over the courses. They're both cheaper and are happening more frequently. There's also a blog there. Um, you can subscribe to a mailing list if you're so inclined. And what else is there? Yeah, there's a contact page where if you really wanted to ask a specific question or maybe it wasn't answered on our, on our FAQ, on our about pages, the techlearningcollective.com slash contact page lists both our general email address and a PGP key and even a signal number that you can reach out to us with. Cool. Is there anything I forgot to ask you about that you'd like to touch on before we end the interview? No, I really appreciated the questions. I really appreciate the opportunity also to to sort of elaborate on some of our, our thoughts. It's always hard to get so much of this into, you know, a, a 2000 some odd word article. So this is this one, I'm sure maybe longer than we expected, but I had fun. I hope you did too. Thank you so much for inviting us on. I, I did. I had a lot of fun. But yeah, thank you for joining us. I know everyone else is going to really enjoy everything that you've had to say today. That was the Tech Learning Collective. Thanks again. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks. You as well.